morning. Good morning. Mm. What could be better than just hearing these voices from all over the world? Just what a foretaste of heaven, huh? Uh, let, let's all just right now say praise the Lord in our own native tongue. On the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Praise the Lord. Mm. <laughs> awesome. Well, um... You know, one thing that I always love to do in thinking about this, the cause of the fatherless, is, is to recognize what a small piece of it we are, not only in terms of what's happening all around the globe, but in terms of the depth of history of the church. And I love looking back. Some of you may remember last year when we shared, I talked about how in the, in the days of the Roman Empire, the Romans had a practice called exposing. And they would, if a, if a child was unwanted because it was the wrong gender or deformed or just inconvenient, they would take this child outside of the city and leave it there for the wind and the rain and the wild animals. And Christians, even though they were small and persecuted minority at the time, earned a reputation as a people who would go outside the city and find these children and bring them in and raise them as their own in many cases. And that has been the identity of the church throughout history. There were, there were many in the early days. In fact, in the early church, the candidates for elders were actually required to be lovers of orphans. That was one of the, the standards that they had to, to reflect. And, and there were many in that time that were known for this. There was a, a woman named Afra of Augsburg. She was a former prostitute, and she came to know Christ, and it totally changed her life. And she spent the rest of her years caring for children who had been abandoned, children of prisoners and others. And she even set up a network of Christian Christian families who would receive children and often adopt them into their, into their families. And you see this throughout history. And in, in the 6th century, Justinian, some of you who are, who are our Eastern European brothers and sisters probably know about Justinian. He had the famous code of Justinian, and he banned the practice of exposing. And he actually required that if a child was found abandoned, that it be taken in and not just treated as household help or a slave, but loved and embraced, and even he encouraged, specifically it said, that they be adopted even as we ourselves have been adopted into the kingdom of grace. Oh, yeah. Wow. That was the sixth century. And all throughout history, we have seen that identity in the church. And you ask yourself, why is this? Why is this so central to the Christian DNA and, and in such sharp contrast often to the cultures around it? And I don't know, David, do we, do we have the PowerPoint yet? So who, who knows who these awesome guys are? Does anyone have a guess who, who these amazing people are? That's right, Roman gods. Wow, don't they look impressive? Aren't you just ready to bow down? And, you know, they, they, they actually had many admirable qualities, but the Roman gods and, of course, the, the gods of Mesopotamia before them, of the Baals and Moloch and, and, and Astra and the others, and, and you think about the gods perhaps from the regions that, that you are from, and, and they have certain qualities, perhaps, that are admirable. But, but if you start to study them, you realize they're, they're a lot like us. They're, in many ways, all too human. And, and who is it they're interested in? I mean, they're, they're really most of the stories about them interested in, in the generals, right? And the athletes and the, and the really strong and fast and handsome and beautiful ones. So, you know, they might have been interested in, in Pastor George, right? But what about the rest of us? <laughs> But the God of the Bible, you have this incredible contrast to that. And, and you know, if, if uh, Ruslan could start out with Deuteronomy, then that gives me permission as well here. Deuteronomy 10, it says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Totally apart, totally different than these other gods that surround it utterly powerful and above, and yet the very next line is this, he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. Wow. And so if you worship a God that brings together those things, then those, those attributes and those qualities, a willingness to be strong and yet humble and near to the most hurting becomes part of your DNA as well. That's what all of this flows from. I, I saw an article in um, National Geographic a couple summers ago. David, if you show the next slide, it was about storms on the surface of the sun. And it talked about these solar flares that would, that would billow up from the surface of the sun. And, and you can see one here. And, and, and some of them were large enough to encompass a hundred Earths. 
And the, it, touching it, of course, would just instantly incinerate anything on this planet. And, and then the article went on to describe that this, the sun here, what we see as the sun, is just one unexceptional star. One unexceptional star. The whole universe is littered with these. And yet it's the God who created this who says that he is especially near the most destitute, the most lonely. That little child that, that even the, the shopkeeper on the street will walk past. God says, that boy, that little girl matters to me. And so when we do the same, we're reflecting his heart to the world. We're broadcasting who God really is, his, his core character in such powerful ways. Well, David asked me to, to share some reflections on, on things that I have seen as I've gotten the privilege of spending time with people across the U.S. and in many other parts of the world that are, that are nurturing local movements and part of this global movement of Christians who are in many ways re-earning our historic reputation as defenders of the fatherless, rediscovering these things that have been part of the DNA of the Christian church throughout history. And, and, and what is it that really makes for a vibrant movement? What are the ingredients, not necessarily that are, that are in any way formulas, but what do you see? When there's a healthy movement, what are the pieces that are there consistently? And, and you know, it, it makes me remember, I, I have a good friend who's a, an Olympic marathon runner. And I was over at his house, my wife and I were staying there, and, and, and I got up in the morning, he was out running, and I, and I looked on his counter, and there were literally about 70 or 80 different bottles of different supplements that had been given to him by these companies that wanted his endorsement. So literally, the counter had like 70, 80, maybe more bottles there. And I was looking at all of them and reading the labels, and he came back from his morning run, and I, I said, Ryan, okay, I really want to know, which of these really works? And he said, you know, I bet a lot of them probably work, but it's really hard to tell. But there's one supplement I, I can say definitively that I have noticed makes a difference. And so then I was really interested. What is it? Which of these? And he said, it's caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. And, and so what I, what I want to think about is what is the caffeine in local movements that does seem to work? Now, of course, we would want to say unequivocally, it's ultimately the Holy Spirit is the source of all of this. But, but my, my father-in-law, he's a pastor. He gets up, he loves to get up super crazy early. Whenever I'm there, you know, I'm usually sleeping an hour or two or more later than him. But he's up that early, and he always has this huge cup of coffee. And sometimes I think he's a little bit addicted to it. And, and I, and I kind of tease him about it, but he says, you know, the, the Holy Spirit and coffee seem to work well together. <laughs> And, and, you know, that's because we are physical beings. God embodied us, and, and Jesus affirmed that by becoming flesh. And so, you know, there's certain physical things that God uses in, in certain ways, and, and they, they work well with the Holy Spirit. And so these, I just want to briefly touch on seven things that I've noticed when movements seem to be very vibrant, that, that seem to be common threads. So the first is this, truly vibrant movements are rooted in prayer. Truly vibrant movements are rooted in prayer. And, and I will be honest, as a, as a uh, recovering Presbyterian, you know, prayer and the Holy Spirit at times are a little, just, I, I can't figure them out. So that's a little uncomfortable. Jody might be able to say amen to that. Can you say amen to that, Jody, as a much more charismatic sister? <laughs> And, and, and I want to be able to take prayer apart like a clock and figure out why it works and how it works. But although scripture gives us some clues to that, it really doesn't tell us. And that's a little bit difficult for me. But what I do know, and this is a quote from Charles Spurgeon, is that prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. That's Charles Spurgeon. What an amazing thought. And what, one of the great wonders of this world is that God has chosen to limit himself in some ways to, to allow us to participate in that. You know, when, when I was growing up, uh, there were four brothers. And my dad, we, we had almond orchards. So next slide here. Here's a quick picture of an almond orchard. Just to give you a sense, you probably don't know. Are they bushes? Are they underground? So they're trees, actually. Those are my kids there. La last time there was the, the blossoms, which is, isn't that gorgeous? And, um, and so we would go out in the orchards and go ahead, you can move, move to the next slide here, but the, um, just to the dark, dark slide there, um, the, uh, we would be out there every Saturday, 
most of the day, some seasons, working all day long, and, and sometimes after school, depending on the time of year. And you know, starting about the time I was probably five or six. And I remember about, I don't know, five years ago, my dad saying something to just really burst my bubble. He said, you know, many of those years, you weren't much used to me. <laughs> he didn't say it directly that, that, that harshly, but he just said, yeah, well, you know, you didn't add a lot of it, but I wanted you out there with me. I love being together, and I wanted you to learn how to work. And, and eventually, I became useful and helpful in, the, in that work. But, you know, and, and, I, and I feel like that something, has something to do with prayer, that God wants us with him, and, and he wants us to learn how to work with him. And so he limits himself in some way to only move when, when we have prayer. And I, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful. The, the part of, of the Christian Alliance Forefront's CAFO is, is working on a new initiative really focused on foster care in the United States. And Jason Weber, who's leading that, has really placed prayer central in the beginning of that. And so every Tuesday and Thursday morning for 15 minutes, there's a conference call where leaders around the country pray for this. What a great way to root this in prayer. And there's different ways that each movement could do that. Well, number two, vibrant movements have core values that are clear but limited. Core values that are clear but limited. St. Saint, Saint Augustine said, said it this way. He said, unity in the essentials, tolerance in the non-essentials, grace overall. And that is a great approach to doctrine. But it's also a great approach to the many nuances to care for orphans that can be so complex. See, if we, if we don't have any clear articulation of core values, we may have unity, but no clear purpose. We're just all getting together and holding hands, but don't accomplish anything. But on the, uh, on the other hand, if we get into the weeds of all of the specific nuances and say, you have to believe this and this and this and this and agree on these points to be a part of this, then, then we may have a clear purpose, but not any unity at all and become narrower and narrower as a community. And so, so vibrant movements have core values that are clear but limited. We, we sought to do this as part of CAFO and created these, these core principles. And it really trying to distill what are the things that we all want to agree on. We're not going to agree on everything, but here are the things that we can share together and then debate and disagree and, and refine each other in many other areas. Number three, clear, uh, vibrant movements. In, e in vibrant movements, each part of the movement is willing to limit itself to its best role. Each part of the movement is willing to limit itself to its best role. So here's, here's another agricultural picture from my growing up years. So we also had some grapes. And these are grapes at the end of summer. This is what it looks like, these grape vines. They're just going every which way, OK? And so you have to go out and prune them in a way that seems almost brutal. So next slide, David. So this is what it looks like after you've pruned, OK? I mean, that is cruel, right? You've got all this amazing growth, and you just cut it down to these nubs. But the reality is that if you don't do that, the next year, those grapes, there will be a lot of them probably, but they will be very small, and they will be somewhat bitter, not sweet at all. Okay, to, to, to do that, to really produce good fruit, you have to prune down to an almost brutal level. And, and Jesus talks about that in John 15, where he describes God the Father as, as the vine dresser or the pruner. And it says that, that he prunes every branch that does bear fruit so that it will be even more fruitful. And we can participate with God in that work of pruning by, by seeking him prayerfully to say, Lord, what is your primary role? What are the, the primary branches that you want me to cultivate? And, and then try to cut off all the others. And, you know, there's always temptation in the other direction, the, the mission creep. You know, maybe a, a donor says, hey, I'd like you to do this over here. Or maybe there's some new hot trend that seems very cool and a lot of the NGOs are working on it and you think, I need to be over there. Or, or, or for, for whatever reason, we, we want to go this way and that. But, but, but really to be, to be at our best, to produce the sweetest fruit. We need to, to do the best we can to focus. And so, like, for instance, with, with the Christian Alliance for Orphans, very often we're pulled towards government uh, lobbying and advocacy. And, and I believe government has a vital role to play. But, but we really want to keep our primary focus on inspiring and equipping the church to play its role. So, you know, I do get pulled into government things because that was my background. My prior work was in that realm, and I spent some time there. But really, we tried very focused way to not put our primary energy towards government. And I, and I feel like that's a vital part of pruning well. Well, number four, truly vibrant movements are motivated not by guilt or duty or idealism. 
And so, so imagine yourself just for a moment. Let's go back about 30 years. It's, it's the 1985, 1988, let's say. And, and you are an anti-polio crusader. Okay, you want to eradicate polio. And in 1988, there were 350,000 people in the world who were impacted by polio. And then imagine this guy travels through time and suddenly appears before you from 2014. And he says to you, good news. Polio is going to go like this over the next three decades. In fact, next slide here, in, in much of the world, there will be only all of the world, just, just a few hundred cases, from hundreds of thousands to a few cases. In each country, here's India, it, we will see graphs like this right towards the end, coming down to zero. Wow! I mean, are you going to be celebrating? Beautiful. And there's reason to, to thank the Lord in that and to thank all the scientists and all of those things. But, but then let's, let's move to the next slide here. The, the, this traveler starts to tell you about something you've never heard of before. He calls it HIV. Some people are calling it Slim's disease about that time. No one knows what it is. But he tells you, you better be careful because it's going to make polio look like child's play. If your sole motivation was just to try to fix the world's problems, when you heard that, you might be tempted to give up. Because our world is so broken. And for every problem we fix, almost certainly another will rise in its place because we know that sin permeates this world. And although beauty is breaking forth in the kingdom of God, this will always be a part of our existence. And so if our motivation is just idealism, or perhaps we're driven by guilt because we've been blessed and we feel we need to do something, or maybe it's just duty. If those things are driving us, for a while they will motivate us and carry us forward, but, but ultimately they will run dry in the face of the world's great need. The only thing that can carry us through those moments when we see that clearly is if we are drawing from a deeper source when we know how deeply we have been loved and we are seeking to love in like manner. We love because he first loved us. And, you know, I know as, as leaders, it's very tempting to often resort to duty or guilt or idealism to motivate others. And that's not always bad. There's a place for guilt. Sometimes we should feel guilty for an action. And we do have a duty to be our brother's keeper, right? And it's beautiful to think of the things that can be accomplished. We should, we should emphasize those. But ultimately, if those are the primary thing, then they will run dry. And so we need to continually root our movements in God's first love for us. That's the only thing that can go the distance. Number five, truly vibrant movements have leaders who are quick to listen. And you know, of course, as leaders, we, we have great ideas and we have things we want to say. But James wrote, be quick to listen, slow to speak. And I, I remember when, it, when a group of uh, adult adoptees approached um, some, some others, some friends of mine, and they were really frustrated with some of the, the messaging that had come out um, from, from the Christian Alliance for Orphans. And they, they felt like it was, it was disrespectful of adult adoptees. And, and, and I totally disagreed. And, and honestly, I felt frustrated. And I, and, I, and I wanted to go and just tell them why I thought they were wrong. But, but thankfully, just it, it, ultimately, I, I thought, you know, no. I, I need to start with listening. And I, and I set up a call with, with one of these individuals and others and just started hearing what they had to express. And I realized, man, there were certain ways in which they were right, way, things that we needed to correct, and then also ways in which perhaps they were being oversensitive, but simply by, by being listened to and being understood, that, that took some of the, 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 the hurt out of the situation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, Christians, especially ministers, and that could go for leaders as well, so often think they must always contribute something when they are in the company of others. Say something. But this is our one service that we have to render. We forget that listening can be a greater service than speaking. Number six, vibrant movements speak openly of both the beauty and the hurt. Speak openly about the beauty and the hurt. And you know, again, another attribute of, of leaders is that they can paint pictures of a beautiful future that we can move towards. And they can inspire people by good things and painting those pictures. And that is a very, very good thing. But if you look at the Bible, you, you, you realize that it, this is not the way that God often communicates. And especially think about the Psalms. The Psalms talk about taste and see that the Lord is good. 
but also, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or praise the Lord, all his servants, the heavens declare the glory of God, and yet the darkness is my only friend. The Psalms weave together this hurt and the beauty and the celebration and the ache together. And honest communication about our world and about orphan care and about adoption, all of these things continually weaves these things together. And I, I would say that I feel like one of the mistakes that the, 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 the orphan care movement in the United States made early on was it, it really was at times guilty of what we could call adoption cheerleading. It would point out the beauty of adoption, how, the, how God had adopted us, and these good things that happened through adoption. That was all true. But it didn't always talk about the costliness of that journey and, and how deep the hurts can be of a child who's lived on the streets or an orphanage and what it takes to love and heal that child and how healing isn't always complete the side of heaven. Those are things that we need to speak very frankly of as well. Those are, those are things in which we realize that adoption and other forms of care for orphan, they mirror the gospel story, both in its beauty and its costliness. And we need to speak frankly about that. And then finally, number seven, vibrant movements, in vibrant movements, grace covers sin. Grace covers sin. You know, you, you would think, well, if you get all the other ingredients right, those first six things we talked about and many of the others, and we get our technical knowledge down right, that things are just going to flourish and be beautiful, right? And of course, we know all too well that that is not the case. Even at their best, very vibrant, healthy movements have uh, just an immense amount of conflict and personalities and egos butting up against each other. And even if every other person in the movement were perfect, we're there. We're bringing those things because our heart is that way too. And you know, just knowing that would be enough to make you want to give up on the whole enterprise, except for one thing. When you look at the Bible, when you look at all the great heroes of the faith, they exhibited those same qualities too. That's why Colossians 3, it describes us, it says, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, patience, gentleness. You know, those, those character traits, those, those virtues are only operative and useful and necessary in a broken community. To be patient compassionate, humble. Those are necessary when those around us are broken and they are necessary because we ourselves are of course that way also. And so the key to a, to a vibrant movement not splintering and staying together, the key to unity isn't hoping that there won't be conflict and hurt and sin and egos. It is praying that grace will cover those things. Well, of course, as, as, we, as we look back on all that, we once again have to remind ourselves of that, that very first truth, that all of this flows not from great plans and having all the right principles in place. It is the Holy Spirit breathing life and interacting with our humanness in ways that ultimately bring him glory. And that is what is happening. That is what is happening all across the world. I know in, in so many of your lives and countries, Despite the hurt, despite the, the, the brokenness that interweaves with the beauty, despite the egos, despite our imperfect motivations, God is at work. Beautiful things are happening. And we all just get the privilege of being a small part of that.